So hello and good evening. Uh, welcome to the last talk uh, in the Videogram series of this year. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Thomas Moynihan. Thomas Moynihan is a writer and researcher based in the UK. His research and field of interest focus on the history of ideas of human extinction, as well as expectations and hopes concerning the future of life in general. He got a PhD from Oriel College at Oxford and currently he's a research fellow at the Fortot Foundation. Thomas is the author of X Risk, How Humanity Discovered Its Own Extinction, published by Urbanomics and MIT Press back in the 2020, a study that offers a cross-section of possible extinction pathways from the global pandemics, nuclear holocaust, climate catastrophe, to AI sovereignty and genome editing. He has written for BBC Future, New Scientist, and The Guardian, among others. Thomas, uh, thank you for being uh, with us today. And now I would like to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the title of my talk today is uh, Animalitarianism in Times of Turbulence. Uh, and it's about what encounters with non-human intelligences have taught us about our own. So without further ado, Despite putting questions to nature, as the philosopher Francis Bacon once suggested, science was revealed to us a strangely silent world, where once divinity's lessons were read out from the structure of the cosmos itself. Now outer space answers our outward bound signals with only stony stillness. There is no response to our call. Where once the bestiary and fable allowed each and every animal to sing to us its instructive lesson, we now recognize that we have never yet held a philosophical dialogue with another species. The animals don't speak to us, but that hasn't stopped us from trying. Indeed, in our study of other minds and growing recognition of their alienness on their own independent terms, a kind of dialogue has been going on, even if it is actually more of a soliloquy. The animals are our relatives, but their relative distance illuminates. This helps us pinpoint our own foibles and, as many have liked to think, also our fate. Another consequence of nature's silence, its recalcitrance to question and response on our own terms, as revealed by science, has been a heightened sense of alienation. The human increasingly feels unrooted, artificial. In response, a certain strain or motif has emerged, which holds that animals are happier because more natural than us. Another consequence of, oh no, that is a duplicate slide. So wrote John Wilmot, Earl of Rochester in the late 1600s. Were I, who to my cost already am, one of those strange prodigious creatures, man, a spirit free to choose for my own share, what case of flesh and blood I please to wear, I'd be a, donkey, a dog, a monkey or a bear, or anything but that vain animal who is so proud of being rational. That's some of my favorite lines from all of English poetry. First, one should point out that it's almost certain that we are the only species on Earth whose members have ever felt this way. We are the only species whose members can feel this way. Ironic that Wilmot's poem begins with a subjunctive, where I, indeed, needs to begin with a subjunctive, as this is almost certainly a uniquely human linguist linguistic skill. Subjunctives allow us to want to be otherwise. Ironic that is quintessentially human to want to be something else. The humour of Wilmot's opening lines lie in its own semi-self-conscious failure. Such feeling has been called animalitarianism or theriophily. It is certainly ancient and history historians of ideas like Arthur Lovejoy have long documented its commonality throughout classical writings. However, no doubt it has undergone permutations and possibly become more pronounced in the modern and scientific age, wherein humanity's sense of alienation and uprootedness has been much exacerbated by science's serial disillusions. Humans have clearly always looked to other minds, natural, supernatural, tangible, fictional, to attempt to gain a measure on our own. But this has gained novel tenors, the more our own inherent superiority has been put in question in the scientific age. One such serial scientific disillusion, and perhaps the acme of alienation, culminated during the 20th century. It was an encounter with a new type of silence, that of humanity's potential extinction. 
With the invention and proliferation of nuclear weapons and other looming technological powers, humans suddenly had the power to silence themselves. Predictably, people turned to the animals to think this through. Animalitarianism fulfilled a new role. So for the rest of this talk, I want to explore two such episodes in our search for ourselves in alien minds. One falling before the invention of the bomb, the other falling after. As we will see, though, both involved reassessments of the wiles of relatively domestic species, depending on your definitions. The ramifications and implications for intelligence as such tended to be become quickly become cosmic in their scope. So moving to the first animal, ants. It is 1919 and a young astronomer turns a street corner in Pasadena, California. Something seemingly humdrum on the ground distracts him. It's an ant heap. Dropping to his knees, peering closer, he has an epiphany about deep time, our place within it, and our uncertain fate. The astronomer was Harlow Shapley. He worked 25 miles away at Mount Wilson Observatory, peering deep into space. With help from colleagues like Henrietta Leavitt, Shapley went on to measure the Milky Way. Their work revealed that we don't live at our galaxy's center, and that there are many other galaxies besides. Lifelong advocate of progressive causes, Shapley also reflected often regularly upon humanity's further future alongside the risks jeopardizing it. He was amongst the first to suggest during a lecture given while, while World War II raged that humanity should learn the lesson from 1918's pandemic and prepare properly for the next one. Instead of battling each other, he prescribed a design for fighting the risks facing all of humanity, declaring war on the gamut of evils from pandemics to poverty, endangering the whole globe. Only two audience members applauded. It appears we didn't take heed. Shapley also was obsessed with ants. By night, he mapped the cosmos at the largest scales. By day, he studied the smaller scale universe of ants, publishing path baking papers on his discoveries during his time at Mount Wilson. Later, near his life's end, Shapley could mercurially recount many entomological episodes, as he liked to call them. The time he abducted ants from Egyptian pyramids, storing one in a friend's watch. The time he pickled one in vodka to the amusement of Soviet colonels. The time he accidentally smoked some, forgetting he had preserved them in his tobacco pouch. Some colleagues didn't understand the fascination. Connecting big picture cosmology to humanity's destiny makes sense, sure. But connecting either with bugs seemed left field, even oddball. Shapley's funny, they sighed. But Shapley was not the only ponderer of the interwar period to conscript ants to reflect upon human destiny. Far from it. Shapley's generation had gained renewed respect for the creatures. It had just been discovered that they had developed civilization long before us. Millions of years before, in fact, proving that complex society doesn't have to be vertebrated because we vertebrates aren't even nearly the first to make the attempt. Kneeling in the street corner dirt in 1919, Shapley knew he was face to face with a, quote, living fossil society, unquote. An ancient civilization, epochs elder than our own, and in its own silent ways, more experienced. Mapping galaxies may locate humanity in space, Shapley realized, but considering that ants gives us orientation in time. Though pre-modern monotheistic people often believed the entire world was wrought by an intelligence all too human, and thus they felt fully at home, the picture of modern science has left many feeling more alone, adrift in an undesigned, unintelligent cosmos. That's why when scientific inquiry has thereafter proved other organisms far more adept than previously assumed, and even our compares in certain aptitudes, people use them as a kind of mirror within which to reflect upon our own peculiarities. Each time we discover another mind, we clamor to conclude what it reveals about our own, because comparison and contrast help pinpoint what might be essential to all intelligences, no matter their origin or ancestry and the contingencies of that, and what might be incidental to Homo's brand of braininess. Presently, we are captivated by the smarts of the octopus, for Shapley's interwar generation, however, it was the social insects, ants, bees, wasps, termites. That's why. Of course, invertebrate smarts have long been admired, 
uh, Proverbs 6 from the Bible reads, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Later, uh, Ibn Khaldun wrote that man alone among the animals cannot exist without government. But he also admitted that it is true that something like this also exists in the bees and social insects. Even later in the 1730s, uh, the entomologist Rumer wrote that we behold in animals and in insects as fully as in any others processes which incline us to assume a certain degree of intelligence. But the insects are reproached with having processes that are too uniform. They do not exhibit sufficiently varied activities. But even if the insects performed actions more surprising and more varied than our own, they would yet gain nothing in the estimation of those who are determined to refuse them souls. So it was a long and open question as to whether intel the intelligence of insects was really that sophisticated. This question continued into the Victorian era. In 1879, the English eccentric John Lubbock borrowed a very sensitive microphone from the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, which he promptly inserted into an ant heap to ascertain if its denizens were talking to each other at volumes too quiet for human hearing. More enduringly, he explored whether ants communicate with sense. But despite this being an open debate, few still suggested insects as our comparators or superiors. The poet Coleridge, who lyrically once compared his brain to a beehive, claimed that the filial and loyal bee was merely an evolutionary prelude to the approaching humanity. He wrote, contemplate the filial and loyal bee and above all the manifoldly intelligent ant tribes. Behold the shadow of approaching humanity, the sun rising from behind in the kindling morn of creation. That is to say, Homo sapiens was invariably seen as the final and noblest result of the evolution. Insects contrastingly were dismissed as mere beginners, the least developed of the beasts. However, in the early 1900s, there emerged a galvanized and renewed sense of just how socially accomplished some bugs are. This was thanks to William Morton Wheeler, the entomologist who coined the term superorganism to describe ant colonies in 1911. For Wheeler, as cells cooperate to become an organism, organisms cooperate to become a superorganism, each producing a whole more potent than its parts. Intimations of hive minds are old, going back at least to Averroes, who believed our individual minds are splinters of one supermind. But in the form of insect, hive, insect hives in the early 1900s, the Leviathan had finally become concrete. The coordination of countless individuals submitting to the wider swarm explained the industrial feats of insects. Entomologists and writers of the 1910s and 20s often marveled at their sheer prowess as urbanizers, organizers, agriculturists, and domesticators. This is an illustrative quote from uh, Frederick Husse in 1894. He wrote, Ants have already furnished us with numerous proofs of their intelligence and their prodigious industry. So remote from man, from an anatomical point of view, they are of all animals those whose psychic faculties bring them nearest to him. There is no human industry, he wrote, in which insects have not arrived at a high degree of perfection. As an aside, we've lately discovered that ants mitigate epidemics uh, by practicing self-isolation and social distancing, a design for fighting Shapley might have been proud of. However, there was all this knowledge and new recognition of the social complexity of ants, but the question was asked again, was this truly intelligence? Ever since Khaldun, many had dismissed the social intricacy of in insects as mere instinct, rigid, unreasoning, inflexible, not pliant and free. But the question now seemed more ambiguous. One French entomologist in the early 1900s remarked, we have a feeling that the psychic evolution of these animals is not less original than their structure and that they are never so widely separated from us as when they appear to resemble us the most. The old anthropocentric school is indeed dead. We, are no, longer attempt, we no longer attempt to explain insects by man. We rather try to grasp the mechanism that allows these animals to evolve mentally and to acquire activities which seem human. For perhaps the first time, it had to be accepted that a very different type of mind heralding from an absolutely unrelated branch of life 
had produced solutions to convergent social organizational problems, but with very divergent means. So wrote W. Uh, R. W. G. Hingston in 1928. This is what we speak of as convergent evolution. A common origin is out of the question. We must regard the two groups as if they were two separate discoverers that had hit independently on the same inventions. But beneath all this, there arrived in tandem a lesson yet more revelatory. Insects had not only solved many of the issues facing social beings, they had done so millions of years before humanity even became social. Since the mid 1800s, paleontologists have been piecing together a global geologic time scale by comprehensively cataloging, cataloging which organisms appear in each successive epoch. This meant not only the comparative ordering of the appearance of genera could be assessed, but it also meant the duration of survival for lineages of life could be compared and contrasted. Already in 1876, Alfred Fr Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution, was commenting that insects appear to be far more ancient than many of life's other branches, at least the terrestrial ones. The cockroach was immediately recognized as among the eldest. By the 1880s, scientists were dubbing the Carboniferous period some 300 million years ago as the age of cockroaches. So wrote L. Wright in 1893, before even the great reptiles down among the trilobites and the early fishes, we find our cockroach. Mammals, by comparison, seem to have been born yesterday. More importantly, it seemed roaches had hardly changed their design across this astonishing span. A true conservative, multiple writers remarked. Social insects aren't quite as old by comparison. But where scientists in the 1880s surmised ants had developed social habits a measly five million years ago, Wheeler was soon demonstrating from fossil ants in the 1910s, they had been cooperating and had remained largely stable in their ways of life for some 65 million years. Our civilization had only consolidated with humans starting to cooperate at large scale by comparison in the past six or so thousand years. Suddenly, civilization was positively ancient just not human civilization it wasn't just that we no longer were the only social being in earth on earth we weren't even the first to make the attempt compared to the well-proven antiquity of the insect humanity a mere late arrival suddenly seemed positively unproven bugs had been around for ages before us having persisted magnitudes longer than hominids so they seemed touted to outlast us, outlast us, many thought. People thus began worrying that we latecomers might be, quote, destined to a far shorter use of the earth, unquote, that insects might be around long after we have joined the dinosaur and the dodo. It became common to imagine that the insects would outlast humanity and that they would still be around long after humans had gone extinct. It was through the perspective of the bugs that authors projected forwards in order to look back and provide a retrospective ubi sent for humanity. W.J. Holland provided a good version of this motif in his book from 1903 on moths, where in the final paragraphs he wrote, When the moon shall have faded out from the sky, and the sun shall shine at noonday a dull cherry red, and the seas shall be frozen over, and the ice cap shall have crept downward to the equator from either pole, when all cities shall have long been dead and crumbled into dust, and all life shall be on the very last verge of extinction on this globe, then on a bit of lichen, growing on the bald rocks beside the eternal snows of Panama, shall be seated a tiny insect, preening its antenna in the glow, glow of the worn out sun, representing the sole survival of animal life on our earth, a melancholy bug. The motif was very common during these years. Many accordingly questioned whether this human era would be followed by the age of insects. Sci-fi authors predicted a post-human world billions of years in the future, populated exclusively by warring civilizations of giant termites and ants. Others began remarking that, given the sheer ecological success of ants, it was already the age of insects. So I wrote an author in the Atlantic Monthly in 1929. 
The world's history needs to be rewritten once more. It has already been told in terms of politics, economics, geography, climate, sea power, war, race, sex, and of great men and heroes. It should next be written in terms of insects. This is not the age of man. This is the age of insects. Given all of this, it no longer seemed that humanity was so comfortably the sole protagonist and adaptive climax of Earth history, the most inevitable answer to life's game. One ecologist reflected on this in, a 19, in 1926. W.C. Alley wrote, they tend to shake us from our conception of a man-centered world into a truer picture of human importance and unimportance in the animal kingdom. Indeed, prior generations had often assumed that something humanoid was life's inevitable outcome elsewhere on other planets throughout the cosmos. But here on our Earth had been revealed another life way, eminently socialized, yet strangely alien. One essayist remarked that whilst we share with other animals a feeling of terrestrial fraternity and they are not wholly strangers to us, the insect seems not to belong to the customs, the morale, the psychology of our globe. Our rivals, perhaps our successors, they topple confidence that we are nature's favorite children. So if we aren't even nature's favorite children down here, surely the genuine extraterrestrials born elsewhere may likewise favor modes of cogitating foreign to our own. Many began to ask this question at this time. It's, not the coin this, it's no coincidence that this, this was the era when people started imagining aliens as more genuinely alien and often conspicuously insect-like. This is the cover for H.G. Wells' First Men in the Moon. Um, the Lunarians are described as specifically ant-like and hive-minded. But all this also allowed the question to be asked in reverse. If civilization comes in many colors, and many flavors, not all of them sapient, would an alien even deem or classify us as obviously governed by reason rather than blind automatism? The question was wittily posed by Andre Mawa in a 1929 satire called The Earth Dwellers. It is written from the perspective of scientists from Uranus called AE-17, who is studying humanity from afar through his telescope his forthcoming book being titled Social Life Among the Earth Dwellers, which is a clear echo and riff of William Morton Wheeler's own real tome from 1923, The Social Life Among the Insects, which was a centerpiece of this discussion. Anyway, getting back to A17, observing from Uranus, A17 through his telescope sees several bruises upon Earth's surface, bristling like throbbing jelly, Zooming in, he sees that these are, in fact, colonies of minute animals living together. These are, of course, human cities. A17, however, refers to them as man heaps, as we refer to ant heaps. With famed academic objectivity, our Uranian scientist ponders what governs the Earthling's peculiar behavior. Noticing the subservience of humans to seemingly mindless toil, A17 becomes convinced humanity lacks all free intelligence, being compelled entirely by instinct. He even condemns the emerging intellectual fashion amongst his colleagues for suggesting signs of rationality in these lowly earth dwellers. Mawa is clear, clearly here satirizing human egotism. He explicitly alludes to the fact that because we humans blithely assumed we had a monopoly on mind, we failed to notice the sophisticated lifeways alien to our own crawling beneath our feet. But again, if cleverness comes in many flavors and ours isn't the only possible mode, then a further query intrudes. How does our flavor stack up? Enter Archie, the cockroach. Archie is a typewriter bashing roach invented by American humorist Don Marquis in 1916. Writing unpunctuated lowercase doggerel as cockroaches cannot hold down shift and reach the other keys, Archie would commandeer the newspaper columns of Marquis. There he would probe lofty themes from his position of lowly stature. The antiquity and wisdom of ants frequents Archie's verse, invariably as a foil for upstart humanity. In one 1922 column, 
Archie pictures the size difference between bug and human disappearing in light of the galactic vastness then being reported by scientists like Shapley. Compared to cosmic volumes measured in light years, what are humans but fleas? Archie's insect comrades take this opportunity to reprimand humanity for its delusions of grandeur. In chorus, they lampoon the supercilious silliness of this featherless biped, whose egotism they claim is cosmically comical and stellarly absurd. Our poet concludes that men and insects are the same, both transient flecks of starry dust that out of nothing came. Archie then goes on to say, the things man thinks are only things that insects always knew. The things he does are stunts we don't have to think to do. Archie gloats that unestablished and unspecialized, humanity needs constantly to invent to survive. Where human societies depend upon convoluted technologies to farm or fly, insects inheriting a regimen of instinct perfected across deep time rely on more foolproof means. Insects, Archie insinuates, long ago solved many of civilization's problems without ever having to think about it. Beneath Archie's teasing jest, a disturbing suggestion re resonated. Perhaps insects have lasted so long and in a manner more stable and sustainable than humans appear to muster in their rapaciousness and inventiveness, precisely because they aren't encumbered with thought. Rather than relying on the plodding trial and error of natural selection, human society rudders itself via the hastier muddlings of reason, the ability to reflect, correct, and accumulate corrections across generations. Natural selection meanders in the millions of years. Cumulative culture paces mere millennia. This perhaps explains why humans have accomplished so much in such a small amount of time, comparatively speaking. But perhaps it explains also some of our more unsustainable, unstable traits too. Here are some uh, charming illustrations of Archie in the act. Harlow Shapley illum illuminated particularly this idea when in 1924 he wrote, still more instructive in our problem of perspective are social insects such as the bees, wasps and the ants. Long before Eocene time, the ants had so fully and firmly developed a social system that even now, 50 million years later, their descendants can carry on as of old with the assurance of an ample future. Go to the ant, thou sociological sluggard, a great authority almost said. Many an intriguing lesson can be learned from, but not always adapted to the transient civilizations of man. In reasonable harmony with the physical restrictions and with the biotic world of these persistent societies of ants, theirs is, I claim, a splendid social development. Their work is all done by females. The males, when they are permitted to exist at all, are mainly decorative. Shapley went on. Humanity, as a species, has had a short and brilliant career on the face of the earth. Biologically, it seems we are as inexperienced as physically we are frail. Moreover, we are hampered with brains. We have mentality to burn, and many of us do burn it at both ends. Shapley and others around this time in the 20s and 30s worried our abnormal mentalities, as Shapley said, particularly our predilection for technological invention, might soon get the best of us. Then the Earth's future will be inherited by the conservative cockroach, nesting within the fossilized skull of some extinct primates, as Shapley once pictured. Other scientists echoed the message during the 1920s. In the Great War's wake, some implored that we become more cooperative, like the ant. Any creature, they argued, which begins building megapolises and meddling with atoms without overcoming, overcoming belligerence cannot survive. In 1925, Erwin Schrodinger wrote, Man, who is obviously much younger than ants, is only, to be, only beginning to abandon his egotism. With us, this transformation is even now in progress. It is bound to take place with all the necessity of natural law. For an animal which advances to the building of cities without abandon, abandoning egotism will not survive. Others saw immediately the darker implications of the suggestion that in order to survive, human civilization ought to tend the way of the authoritarian ant. Sure, it might bring some sense of security and stability, as seems typical of the insect hive in our projections, 
but would not such an outcome be tantamount to authoritarian forfeiting of all basic human freedom? Accordingly, science fiction authors in the 20s thus imagined a future situation wherein humanity submits itself to an emergent superorganism, emerging from global flows of cooperation, trade and technology, which comes to usurp humanity as the protagonist of world history. Gaston de Pavlowski described the appearance of such a global social organism in one of his novels as, quote, the unexpected, gigantic, and quite incredibly unnoticed emergence of a new being, superior to man, tightly enslaving him, which robbed him of the sovereignty of the world without his even suspecting it, and which assumed his succession in the scale of living beings. This colossal animal was afterwards called the Leviathan. The Leviathan, following the model of the marine hydra, repudiates as illusory any idea of central consciousness, and considers the human and social entity as simple colonies of polymorphous individuals specialized to material needs whose mere juxtaposition forms the entirety of the community. Anyway, such sermons upon the relative stability or instability of us compared to the ants may have seemed idle. Indeed, in 1929, Archie himself typed carefreely about the mighty atom that splits a planet asunder. But 24 years later, the first atomic bombs detonated, and the question of cooperation at global scale became existential. The year following Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1946, US authorities displaced the indigenous people of Bikini Island, preparing to initiate nuclear tests there. Boats loaded with livestock were readied for exposure to the blasts to study the effects of radiation. A few months before testing began at Bikini, the New Yorker suggested one more passenger be included alongside the farmyard animals. It was good old Archie the cockroach. The reporter for the New Yorker was E.B. White, later the author of Charlotte's Web, so no stranger to fictionalizing and ventriloquizing insects. By this time, however, in 1946, Archie was retired because Don Marquis, his creator, had died. But White announced that Archie's writings are pertinent today as the cosmos slithers drunkenly into its bikini lagoon phase. Why? Because, White claimed, Archie's pedigree goes back 100 million years and will probably be good for another 100 million because the cockroach is the creature most likely to survive the atomic age. White referenced a prophetic 1944 magazine article titled Superbug which had extolled the roach as virtually indestructible. So it was that, thanks to Archie, a potent Cold War motif had been born. For decades after, many forewarned, forewarned the cockroach would be the only winner of World War III. This picture, I think, perfectly sums up this idea. You see along the bottom, the bugs as this stable, uh, perpetual um, lineage, and humanity on top, this upstart with a question mark in front of its future. This was the true lesson of orientation in time as it flashed before Shapley at the street corner back in 1919. Humans have, comparatively speaking, only just appeared on Earth. The ants prove by concrete example that certain lineages, indeed if you stretch the terms societies and civilizations, can and do endure long term. But humanity, volatile, upstart, unstable, unpredictable, had just invented nuclear weapons, or at least was going, was going to go on to. As the Cold War opened and this new age of instability began, existential instability, a new non-human intelligence was discovered and a new creature became the focus of our anim animalitarian pondering and longing replacing the roach and the ant. It was the dolphin. The year is 1961. As Cold War tensions crescendo, an American neuroscientist named John C. Lilly makes a bold claim. He announces he has made contact with the first alien intelligence. But Lilly wasn't talking about little green men from Tau Ceti. He was talking of minds much closer to home, bottlenose dolphins. In 1961, he wrote, within the next decade or two, the human species will establish communications with another species, 
non-human, alien, possibly extraterritorial, more probably marine, but definitely highly intelligent, perhaps even intellectual. Liddy had spent the past decade hammering electrodes through animals' craniums, attempting to map the reward systems of their brains. Having started probing the grey matter of macaques, he was shocked when he acquired some dolphins to test upon. Swiftly, he became convinced of their smarts. Upon hearing dolphins seemingly mimic human vocalizations in what he called their high-pitched Donald Duck quacking-like way, he became certain that they also spoke to each other in Dolphinese. This was quite a radical suggestion at the time. Lily was one of the first to really demonstrate how socially intelligent these animals really are. Of course, others had long made similar claims. Ancient Greek authors celebrated the nobility and philanthropy of the cetacean, recounting tales of human dolphin companionship. But in the modern era, this aquatic mammal fell into disrepute. One 19th century captain referred to them as warlike and voracious. In 1836, Frederick Cuvier remarked on this fall from benevolent angel to carnivorous brute, deeming the wild dolphin a stupid glutton. But given their prodigious brain size, Cuvier entertained their potential for intelligence. They have no natural competition and live in abundance. Thus, they have no need to cultivate their intellect, he reasoned. Venturing that humans raised in the same state might also be feral, Cuvier suggested that we civilize the dolphins, thereby unleashing their potential for rationality. Over a century later, in the 1960s, Lily was making similar peculiar claims about the perfectibility of dolphins. But he was convinced he would soon have undeniable evidence, cross-species communication. Excited, he made rhapsodic predictions. He foresaw dolphins being deployed as deep sea rescue teams or ocean floor cartographers. Perhaps they could wage psychological warfare on enemy submarines, he suggested. He went even further, speculating about the potential for interspecies psychoanalysis. He wrote, so far, the dolphins have a good reputation with the general public, but should they quickly achieve bilateral conversational level, he thought, we are in trouble because they will quickly become capable of acquiring humanity's accumulated knowledge and there will be what he called a explosive development of dolphin intelligence. Then, he wrote, they will ask for medical and legal protection, or perhaps they might even rise up against us. Adding more urgency, Lilly suggested pushing his research program to its ultimate extreme speed, so that we have some grasp of interspecies communication before the real challenge comes, that is, contact with extraterrestrials. We need to be certain, he argued, our interspecies diplomacy is up to scratch before contacting genuine aliens. Talking with dolphins provides a dry run. Given the potential consequences of miscommunication, he continued, with another technological civilization, neglecting this opportunity might be more devastating than neglect of the political implications of the atomic bomb. Lily was clearly looking for funding, but he wasn't alone in believing that contact with aliens could come very soon. Other scientists around the same time in the 60s held the same view. That is, the opening of the 60s saw what we now call the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI being started in earnest, spearheaded by scientists like Frank Drake and a young Carl Sagan. Indeed, Lilly found himself invited to give a talk at a conference in Greenbank, West Virginia, on the site of Project Ozma. That is, the first coordinated attempt to use radio telescopes to detect messages from other civilizations throughout the Milky Way. Lilly spoke for three hours about his own work communicating with another species here on Earth. Inspired and seeing in this a clear analogue of their own work attempting to contact extraterrestrials, the group of scientists at the conference adopted the moniker the Order of the Dolphin. This was the name for the first, the first version of SETI. Hopes were at this time high that their searches would soon reveal a noisy galaxy. But just as Lily's prophecies of bilateral conversation did not pan out, neither did SETI immediately return any evidence of a populous Milky Way. Instead, thus far, only silence. We did not civilize the dolphin, nor did we tune into a civilized galaxy. 
but Lily's dolphin research nonetheless helped facilitate a sea change in the way we view our own position in the cosmos. The silence of the dolphins was soon echoed by the silence of the sky. As mentioned previously, it remained common well into the 1900s to assume that there's something evolutionarily inevitable about something bipedal, sapient, and humanoid. Of course, Archie would have disagreed, but serious scientists long held to this self-serving assumption that we are the inevitable outcome of evolution. The hunch was so strong that it was common for scientists to propose that should humanity extinguish itself via some act of folly, then we didn't worry too much as humanoids would sooner or later return. The paleontologist William Diller Matthew expressed this opinion in 1928 when he wrote, if however Homo sapiens is extinguished, then indeed the evolutionary clock would be set back some millions of years, but life would recommence its slow upward climb with the leisurely steps of progress from such higher stages as survived. In far distant ages to come, the future destiny of the world might be committed into the hands of some super intelligent dog or bear or glorified weasel. He also speculated that if all the mammal branch was destroyed, quote, the lizards might rebuild the age of reptiles, evolving into progressively higher intelligent animals, end quote. But if such genius be such an evolutionary inevitability and so eminently adaptive, then how do we explain the fact that it went on mid-century to invent weapons of mass destruction, threatening its own very existence and persistence? After the invention of thermonuclear weapons, many intellectuals started to ask such uneasy questions. So wrote Arthur Kostler in 1955. The human race, he argued, may be a biological misfit doomed to extinction like the giant reptiles of an earlier age. I believe that some apocalyptic intuition of this kind may be one of the reasons for the sudden interest in life on other stars. There was one problem. Where are they all? As the 1960s opened and the Order of the Dolphin became dismayed as it became clearer that the Milky Way was no cacophonous cloud of thinking stars. However, despite this, the newspapers gleefully reported on Project Ozma and particularly Lily's involvement with the search for extraterrestrials. It was relayed that Lily had revealed a resident alien intellect. The only reason we've thus far overlooked their braininess is because dolphins are, so it was written, not technically inclined like humans. One journalist, inheriting Lily's own inclination for fanciful exaggeration, wrote that cetaceans could possess a far greater intelligence than humans, but because they lack hands, these oceanic superintelligences would never be able to build telescopes or initiate communications. This was taken as potentially instructive concerning the lack of signals from aliens. It was said that here on our own planet, seemingly advanced intelligences have evolved without any impulse of standing upright to scour the, sky, to scour the skies or to pollute the planet with fallout. Suddenly, technically inclined minds like our own seemed less cosmically inevitable, more contingent, more fragile. In Lily's own words, May there not be other paths for large brains to take. Talking to the press, Frank Drake, the grandparent of SETI, argued that technological civilization is surely highly adaptive, such that, he wrote, it seems reasonable to believe it will develop on most life-bearing planets. More cautiously, however, he did also note that not all experts on evolution accept this. And as a sign of the times, he pointed to the bottlenose dolphin as evidence that intelligence need not be technological. Extending this sentiment, in 1960, the Baltimore Sun published a satirical piece envisioning Project Ozma establishing contact with the denizens of Tau Ceti. When it is broadcast to the Tau Cetaceans that earthlings are featherless bipeds, all humanity hears and responses cosmic laughter. The aliens, the piece goes on to explain, uh, on their own planet once housed technological apes like ourselves until they wipe themselves out with their own inventions. Then comes the punchline. The Tau Cetaceans are revealed to be porpoises. And the article explains that porpoises are the perfect ultimate form to which nature is working everywhere, that there's a trace of life all over the universe. As with Archie before, 
the dolphin was here being used to cosmically lampoon human hubris. Another story is Leo Szilard's Voice of the Dolphins uh, around the same time, wherein he imagines that extraterrestrials are being drawn to Earth by way of mysterious flashes standing out against the depths of space in their telescope surveys. Darkly, however, we find out that this is not the sonorous phosphorescence of thought, but rather the sickly afterglow of nuclear war, betrayed by spectrographic signatures of uranium explosion. In the 1950s and 60s, against the Cold War backdrop, the suggestion caught on. Perhaps the sky is so quiet because alien civilizations all developed hydrogen bombs and then annihilate themselves, hence the chilling stillness of space. The anthropologist Lauren Isley uh, expressed this sentiment best. He wrote in 1957, Today, as never before, the sky is menacing. Things seen indifferently last century by the wandering lamplighter now trouble a generation that has grown up to the wail of air raid sirens. Without the evidence of more advanced extraterrestrial civilizations to comfort us that the passage ahead for humanity is navigable, Isley looked to our brother mammals down here on Earth for a sense of humanity's destiny. Yet their inscrutability provided little comfort. Instead, they proved to be a blank canvas upon which to project. Isley, therefore, wistfully romanticized dolphins as the prelapsarian alternative to human fallenness. He wrote that there is nothing more alone in the universe than man. The dolphin, he continued, is, almost, is an almost disembodied intelligence floating in the wavering green fairyland of the sea, an intelligence possibly near or comparable to our own, but without hands to build, to transmit knowledge by writing, to alter by one hair's breadth the planet's surface, or poison with strontium the planetary winds. Again, where previously minds like ours had seemed so blatantly beneficial and adaptive as to be everywhere inevitable, the dolphin became a symbolic conduit for the admission that technological civilizations may well be cosmic flukes. The step to technology may not be so inevitable after all. Neither outer space nor our kindred mammals had answered our pleas for signs of minds like ours, and with this came a new sense of cosmic precarity and preciousness for the human project. By 1960, one anthropologist asked the same question again. William W. Howells in 1960 wrote, what about the chances of humans coming into existence again, not elsewhere, but on this very planet? Supposing in a moment of idiot progress, we really killed ourselves off. Would Homo rise again? Glancing through the tree of life, seeing that only one twig had blossomed into sapience of our technical sort, Howells concluded, all in all, our hopes for repetition are not good, so we had better stay the hand that drops the bomb. The idea even permeates science fiction, where there are recurrent images of humanity evolving into something porpoise-like, forfeiting our large brains, abandoning the high stakes world of techno science in pursuit of a simpler, yes, reflective life underwater. One example is Kurt Vonnegut's sardonic 1985 novel, Galapagos. It follows the surviving human population of a global collapse relegated to island refugia. Over countless generations, evolution parsimoniously sacrifices the big brains of the survivors, so they become streamlined semi-aquatic animals with shrunken skulls, happy and post-prelapsarian. -post no longer worrying about air raids or financial, financial crashes. So wrote Isley, reflecting on the dolphin in 1961. If man had sacrificed his hands for flukes, the moral might run. He would still be a philosopher, but there have been taken from him the devastating power to wreak his thoughts upon the body of the world. Nonetheless, Despite Isley and many other pe others' porpoise romanticism, it could not be the case that humans could have forgone technology while still remaining philosophical. The dolphin, that perfect floating signifier, has become a peaceful other, which we ventriloquize to voice our sense of our own mechanized fallenness. Ironic that they were once warlike and voracious. But technological is not an optional qualifier of humanity. Plausibly, since Homo erectus, our very physiology has been moulded by our inventions. Moreover, 
it was technology that made humans philosophical. Through distancing our ancestors from pressing needs and interests with crop surfaces and city safe holds, the burgeoning of technological civilization is what first facilitated disinterested curiosity and inquiry. Without technology, we would be worrying too much about our next meal to be ethicists. We certainly wouldn't be able to ponder the science of the cosmos philosophically. Longing, therefore, for the pre or post technological peacefulness of the dolphin is not only longing for the end of technology with all its destructiveness and unintended consequences, but it is also longing for the end of philosophy and reflection too. Knowledge is necessarily double edged. By becoming aware of right and wrong, we become capable of recognizing good and bad in our actions with equitably immense orders of potential magnitude for consequence, but one cannot come without the other. Similarly, Longing for the stability and surefire, long, long, surefire longevity, that is existential security of the apparent insect hive, is nothing other than longing for the loss of our liberty, autonomy and freedom. In other words, it would be loss of the ability to do something because, because, because it is right rather than because instinct compels. The obligate altruism of the ants may be admirable from afar and have secured their societies across deep time. But for a sapient species to sacrifice its liberty in the name of mere survival would be too heavy a price to pay. It would have snaffed out its own spark. For our own part, I would prefer to be remained, I would prefer to remain doomed to choose. Thank you. Wow, uh, Thomas, thank you. Uh, well, such an interesting uh, insight. Uh, so please, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to ask them directly or just write them down into the Q&A. Uh, I got a specifically the very uh, interested by the, by, by the moment of the talk when you uh, were describing the ways how uh, the humankind tried to communicate with the uh, living from, from outside of the planet uh like within the our solar system by using the telescope and this like naivety of like uh that the other species will also develop in the same way that they will make something that so they will be uh accessible by by a telescope and i think we are we we face or we are still facing something similar nowadays and this is the uh covid pandemic we have something that is described as the most primitive life form, which is a virus. And, but still operating on a planetary scale. And we, as a humankind, putting ourselves on the top of the pyramid in the verticality, operating to face the virus on a level of national states. Mm. Uh, so my question here is, uh, where you also, uh, or still in this research, are also considering uh, these kind of like living forms as a uh, viruses and their intelligence, and so. Mm, yeah, I, that's a rich question. Um, yeah, so on the question to go back to the beginning, um, uh, I'm not sure. It, it seems naive to us now to this idea that, you know, kind of radio telescopes might pick up signals, but, you know, it's ahead of, ahead of evidence. I, you know, don't think that it was necessarily naive. It was probably, it probably was wishful thinking of people like Sagan to expect that they would just immediately be like this kind of cacophony of intelligence coming back. There was probably some wishfulness going on there. Um, they were hopeful, but they were also not, you know, kind of zealots in this idea that there would be intelligences, um, you know, lots of people before and had also remarked in the other direction, but it definitely was the minor strain of thinking, in my opinion, at least that, you know, it's kind of around sometime I'd say around the 10s, 20s, 30s, and you know, it's in the context of this stuff around insects as well, that some biologists, geologists, um, and evolutionists start remarking that 
uh, given the chanciness of evolutionary processes, there won't be a repeat of humanity elsewhere, which is a very, um, uh, it's an important insight and required a lot of work to get there. Um, so the question of naivete is an interesting one, um, but it took, it, it's, I think it's also important to take stock and see, it's not, the, the, the point here is not to say that these people were naive, it's more to say how much work and sheer effort of thought and discovery has gone into getting us to where we currently are. I think that's more the way of thinking about it, nonetheless. So, you know, it's kind of the first half of the 1900s, people start saying there won't be a repeat of humanity elsewhere, but most of the time when they make these remarks, invariably they also say, but it will be intelligent in some sense. Um, now there's obviously a very big range of what that means and, you know, without being able to ask these people what that means, then we can't really know, you know, what range they were uh, kind of tacitly holding, but you can perhaps assume that they think it would be the communicative technical sort of, of us. Um, now, yeah, to go on to the second part of your question. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a really, there's just an always, uh, this is a banal thing to acknowledge, but there's a really interesting dynamic in evolution where it's, it's the simplest is always kind of, you know, uh, conflicting with the more complex. Um, and yeah, I mean, the kind of, one thing I would say is that um, there, you know, you can make meta inductions where you, uh, you know, induce like the direction of travel from our discoveries about the world and the direction of travel when it comes to like how far down lots of cognitive aptitudes that we previously thought were uniquely human extend throughout the phy phylogenetic tree. I shouldn't say down because that implies a hierarchy, but as in how far across and how, how wide, wide in range. Um, it just seems that, you know, continually we're realizing that, you know, certain aptitudes that we think of as we, people used to think of as uniquely human do extend very far. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't say a virus is intelligent. It's kind of, you know, it brute forces, uh, through its sheer ability to kind of reproduce very quickly and at a much faster rate. So, you know, kind of peer wily in some sense, but it's, you know, there's obviously not intelligent. Um, you know, and, and there's a looseness with these terms here. Like, you know, when I'm saying that ants have civilizations, they clearly don't in like the sense that humans do because humans have civilizations in that sense of a cumulative culture where we cooperate across generations rather than just within them. Um, there are some ways in it which ants do this, but again, it's like a form of ingrained obligate altruism. Um, some ants do provide for posterity in some sense, but you know, humans accumulate, they correct. There's clearly just like a whole nother different qualitative break of autonomy going on. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, you know, kind of the point of the, why I like exploring these things is because this idea of animalitarianism of looking to animals and saying, oh, look how natural they are. Uh, look how much better and happier they are. It's always like, kind of self-consciously failing because it's like a very human gesture to want to be something else. Um, and so it's an interesting way that we think through our own like loneliness and uniqueness um, is, you know, each e epoch and era um, has its obsession with a new mind in a sense. So I would say that currently, I was, I was meaning to put this into the talk, but, you know, um, was rushing, you know, pushing up against uh, timings. <laughs> but um, the, uh, there's, say, if the, the interwar generation, 20s to 40s, had the ant as its kind of other, other intelligence to, like, play around with and reflect upon, um, and that was also the way in which they imagined aliens, then the Cold War had the dolphin, and that was also the way in which they imagined aliens. Now, today, people are interested in, say, cephalopod intelligence and, you know, even stuff like uh, 
slime molds seem to have like very interesting mem memories um, and ability to remember and learn. Um, so, I th and, and you can see that reflected currently in our own kind of, you know, imaginaries of what what is extraterrestrial, uh, <clears throat> you know, arrivals, like an obvious example. Um, but yeah, this is just this kind of interesting uh, history where the aliens that an era, the, you know, the ways in which we project, you know, and imagine aliens is always kind of like inflected by the animal mind that is currently the one that we have this kind of animalitarian like longing for. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I would now also uh, like to point to, um, like back to the X risk. Uh, there you trace the intellectual history of the existential risk or the conception of extinction uh, back to the enlightenment. And uh, on your very first slide of today's lecture, you use this background image, uh, like something that, uh, like some imaginary from the like medieval times, something that looked like, uh, I don't know the word for English, uh, in, in Latin is uh, bestiarium vocabulum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, so I'm um, curious uh, by this uh, research about animatorism, uh, where is the uh, starting point uh, when it becomes to the time in the research? Are you also curious about uh, the way how people were uh, understanding the intelligence of the animal were still the center of the universe with not the human mind, but the, the God? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I like, you know, gestures here very briefly at the beginning of the talk, but uh, so animalitarianism or theory of philly has always been like a theme of philosophy, um, you know, going back at least to like, you know, classical um, uh, Greek, Roman uh, texts um, on a on a kind of more general level humans have very obviously always thought through themselves with animals so you know the first art is kind of these you know uh, like zoomorphic hybrid forms uh you know in cave paintings and etc um i think it's that idea of like you know they are clearly you know you don't need like the darwinian theory of evolution to think of animals as in some sense are like relatives and so their relative difference is what kind of throws our place into relief, um, such as it is. Um, I think, yeah, to, to talk on the best rate, it, it, it's obviously far more complicated than this, but um, in the bestiary, there's a sense in which every animal has its instructive lesson. And similarly, so in like Aesop's fables, um, there's a sense in which each animal will tell us its lesson. And that in a sense is, um, and again, this is making kind of like very reductive generalizations, but that in a sense is like the moral order of the universe being kind of like, uh, spoken to us by these other beings, you know, and that will be kind of God's decree in some sense. Um, and that's why I think it's interesting. This kind of like growing sense of silence that you see with like science's disillusion, the real, the realization that like, you know, the animals aren't just going to give us moral lessons because it's more complicated than that. Nature doesn't inherently have, you know, kind of or so simplistically have an instructive lesson for us uh, or a didactic lesson or something that we should, you know, kind of follow uh, or emulate. Um, and that's that sense of the human being kind of artificial. And so that's what I, I, I find the topic interesting because it's this kind of longing for a sense of place that is continually frustrated by the fact that the human recognizes that it's, you know, or, you know, can in certain modes recognize that, um, you know, as there's, there's a, there's a German tradition called philosophical anthropology, um, 
Paul Ausberg is a good writer from it, but he, you know, spoke of, um, and it goes, it goes way back, but he spoke of, uh, humanity as the mangles phase and which means kind of like, you know, the kind of being without a being like, you know, cause the human is like, can choose, it can correct itself. It can kind of engineer its own desires, correct its own interests. Like, uh, it's kind of amorphous in that sense. So it's like. I, I like the fact that there's this still there's still a longing for place, which seems very inherited from tradition, from classical tradition, from like, you know, monotheism, um, but it's just continually frustrated. And this kind of acme of disillusion, which is the acknowledgement that humanity is, you know, kind of precarious and unprivileged in the sense that not only is it just another kind of biotic species, but it also is existentially precarious like any other. That's kind of this acme of disillusion. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure if this kind of came through enough in the talk, but, you know, there's a lot of kind of, we look to the ants and we like raise them above us. We look to the dolphins, we raise them above us, like this kind of, you know, theriophiliac idea. But ultimately it all actually becomes like whether these writers and thinkers like this or want it or not it becomes an acknowledgement of human freedom uh in the sense that you know that kind of uprootedness that culminates in the acknowledgement of extinction is also this kind of basis for like liberty or at least you know kind of they, they share this similar conceptual genealogical route Thank you. Uh, you also, uh, during uh, your presentation, you point to one of my favorite uh, science, uh, science fiction novels, The Galapagos from Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, uh, is science fiction, uh, uh, do science fiction play an important role when it comes to your research? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it does, uh, definitely. Um, Again, it's like, you know, the definition, depending on definition, um, you know, when does science fiction begin? Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it begins with somewhere in the 1700s. It's definitely already begun by uh, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, Last Man. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, science fiction is, is massive because it's the kind of, it's the imaginary for thinking through what could be um and yeah you know it's the kind of i like the playful in science fiction so that's why i like galapagos because it's kind of sardonic and you know uh humorous it's a satire as much as it's science fiction uh you know i often talk about stanislav lem he's like similar it's always kind of there's this like um swiftian aspect to it um but just in general yeah science fiction is is uh it's the space it's the space to you know open up possibilities and that's that's the that's the side of science fiction that i personally prefer is the kind of this idea of it being more about possibility and plausibility than being about prediction so a lot of the times we think about science fiction in this mode of or at least the themes kind of adjacent to science fiction. So when you have your, your, you know, your kind of Asimovs and, you know, um, et cetera, that it's about like predicting what will happen. So like when we will have this certain technology and I'm not so much more interested in that more like this idea of the future being this capacious space of like branching possibilities. And so you can kind of point to a plausible space and think about whether it whether it is plausible and then further to that if it's not a prediction if it's preferable uh or the opposite and then think about navigating away or towards it um i think that that's in that guise i find it yeah now that's the guise of like play and openness and exploration um but yeah I, yeah super important do you have any tip for uh any contemporary writer uh phew. Ah, well, that's like the opposite of the question you should be asking me because yeah, I'm awful at I'm awful at reading contemporary science fiction and fiction in general because my job is to read stuff from the past. <laughs> but um, 
Let me think. Uh, hmm. What have I read recently? There's, uh, hmm. I've got plenty of books around me. No, there's no inspiration coming. Actually, no. So here's one that I really enjoyed recently. Stretching it on contemporary, but um, uh, it was called um, it's called Mountains, Oceans, Giants, and it's by Alfred Doblin, who is a modernist writer. Let me just make sure I've got. Yeah, the original is called Berger Mira Giganten. I'm probably getting the pronunciation wrong, but it's called Mountain Seas and Giants, and it's this like totally psychedelic 1924 science fiction um, where Doblin imagines that like humanity unlocks this. It's clearly again about unlocking the atom, but humanity unlocks this kind of elemental physical force, and it kind of like disturbs the natural order. Um, and it's written in this like crazy modernist like vorticist disorienting prose but like nature's order basically gets like torn apart and there's this like mutating uh the only way to describe it is craziness that like ripples across the globe and like it begins in greenland i think and then like it's this kind of uh it basically like accelerates mutation in some sense and you know all these like weird these very strange phenomena and animals like they all spread around the globe but if you like stuff like this true gatsky brothers and and uh like vandermeer this kind of idea that like there's a weird nature is already weird but there's a weird beyond the weird that we know and it could like kind of emerge at any point um i'd recommend yeah it's kind of in that weird tradition but it's like written by like a high modernist writer which makes it kind of interesting but um talking on that reminds me of another science fiction author from around the same time who is massively underrated is uh oh, what's his name j a j h rosny am french author probably again mispronouncing but um he wrote some very strange stuff so it's like in this kind of germinal period before science fiction gets like its tropes like ossified to the extent that you kind of recognize in like 50s 60s science fiction so there's some very weird stuff but he writes he writes like a story about how aliens elsewhere in the galaxy are like doing physical experiments and messing with the color spectrum and like certain colors just disappear from the spectrum because of that and on earth uh and it's very much that kind of like potential for like strange contingent disrupt disruptions of the natural order that's yeah it's a theme that i like in science fiction for whatever reason Happy that they point to the Stugarski brothers. Like for me, it was the truth no big bogum. Like it's hard to be a god. Like very like a revolutionary piece, and, and like mm. how to think about the uh, humankind. Uh, yeah, when, when we are by the humankind, we are uh, possibly the uh, only life form that uh, is able to recognize and acknowledge the consequences of its actions mm. uh, when it comes to the extinction. Mm. Do you know about any other example from like non-human uh, living world that uh, by its own activity could cause an extinction? Yeah, well, I mean, so, I mean, based on just, uh, you know, kind of, you know, modern Darwinism, you know, it's like, and also just classical Darwinism that, you know, he had Darwin had this image of wedges as like an ecosystem. You put a wedge in, another one comes out. Um, the yeah, just like life forms in general are unstable and they push others to extinction. Um, uh, but in terms of like the scope for mass, massive, huge, large scale extinctions, it does appear that other animals have done that in the past. Um, so the the example that I think of is this, um, uh, you know, the kind of oxygenation event that happened when uh, cyanobacteria evolved. Um, so these are like photosynthesizing bacteria, uh, and this was a time when you know there was like before multicellular complex life, um, but these uh, things called stromatolites, they're these kind of lumps of cyanobacteria, they kind of proliferate, they photosynthesize, basically kind of uh, cause 
huge amount of climate change by pumping tons of oxygen into the atmosphere as the result of photosynthesis. And there is good evidence to show that it caused a mass extinction where tons of the other bacteria around at the time were all kind of pushed into uh, pushed into oblivion. Um, there was some research recently about how the evolution of trees did a similar thing. So tree trunks then kind of change everything. So it seems like that with major transitions in life it cause these like awful perturbations of the biosphere. Uh, maybe kind of the emergence of techno sapiens is one of those. In a, this is to talk in a very kind of uh, <laughs> lofty and detached way. Obviously, the sixth mass extinction is like a huge tragedy. Um, you know, trying to talk about it objectively in that manner is probably unhelpful. But um, uh, nonetheless, you know, one thing to retrieve from that is maybe that uh, the stromatolites and the tree trunks weren't aware of what they're doing, whereas like we have only just woken up to that kind of scope of consequence and damage and scarring because mass extinctions, I think, tend to reduce uh by like reducing like ecological complexity they reduce kind of they take a long time to recover from that kind of all that complexity has to build back up so it's not just the destruction of present forms it's also a form of scarring on on the biosphere uh you know um again this is you know i'm not an ecologist so don't take any of that on 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 gospel but um uh we can recognize that and so you know that isn't necessarily something to be jubilant about. It's something to be like, you know, it's, it should be a call to action. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay, I will have the last one and then I will uh, let you go. Uh, it's yeah, it's easy question for me, maybe not so for that for answering. Uh, what can we learn from animal intelligence that will prevent our own extinction? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I guess uh, there's a very tentative answer. Uh, I think that well, I think that a virtue that I find very attractive is is uh, magnanimity, which is largeness of heart and also largeness of mind. Um, so, I think that if you look at the history of these things. Um, we've as i as i kind of alluded to earlier we've always tended to look over the sheer sophistication of other forms of life and we're, we're like we've learned and we're learning you know uh now as opposed to 200 300 400 years ago people in general and scientists and you know people that study animal behavior in particular are just so much better at like thinking about these things on their own terms uh rather than projecting our own kind of we still project and you know that's why i find interesting in this kind of you know the fact that we're still projecting onto the natural world even in our disillusioned age that's why i find kind of a funny quirk about this topic but um uh we've become we've become a lot better at like thinking about these things and these other minds and these other kind of life ways on their own terms and I think that is a form of like largeness of heart and largeness of mind. And I think it's that they are, I personally think that they're, you know, each, there is no kind of indwelling hierarchy or order. Like each life way is like, you know, grandiose on its own kind of incremental terms. Um, and I think there's a lesson there in terms of like the openness of like, just never assume that, never assume that kind of, superciliousness of like being like oh of course the ants can't do this because then you know 100 years later it turns out they can uh or assume that dolphins are just like voracious warlike fish when it turns out that they're actually like highly socially sophisticated mammals that potentially have like you know linguistic aptitudes that are, would be like kind of you know shockingly um shockingly like advanced the flip side though is also don't over project and be like like lily who thought like the dolphins have human level language like they they clearly don't um so but it's just, just this openness and so you know when it goes into the more speculative stuff with seti it's like uh, and again this is a theme in lem uh is the, the tragedy is like to not notice mind where it's alien to your own 
and that can lead to you know in Lem's stories like fiasco it leads to like humanity just like destroying this alien uh but then also vice versa if we don't notice intelligence in the right places you know kind of again very speculatively but kind of probing out into the the cosmos then yeah yeah you know things can go wrong so i don't know it's a very tentative answer and it's more science fiction than anything based in fact or you know real advice but uh yeah just be open-minded and large-hearted when it comes to other minds and the potential for them to exist in places that we we don't even begin to acknowledge right now um and you know not that that sounds a bit like i'm advocating for like panpsychism which, which i'm not but like the um the reverse is also true like that flip thing with the uranian scientist where like they look take one look at humans and they're like look how much they spend their time like toiling in cities they're clearly not clever you know so yeah i don't know just be open-minded i guess <laughs> actually i think the call to be open-minded is a very nice end of uh of uh your lecture and our talk uh thomas thank you a lot for uh for your presence for your time and and the very very interesting topic Yeah. And yes, and all the best. And also, uh, thank to all the participants for being with us here. Uh, thank you one more time. Ciao and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for having me.